Hi, welcome to the Teaching Nonviolent Atonement live chat. We are very fortunate to have with us uh, Professor Tracy McKenzie. Tracy, how are you today? It's good to see you. Fine, thank you. Great to be a part awesome. of the conversation. Awesome, love to have you. Suzanne is uh, going to do a little introduction of you, and then I'm going to lead us in a little bit of a calendar, upcoming dates that we're going to have on the live chat, and then we're going to get into our discussion. Great. So, Professor Robert Tracy McKenzie is a native of Tennessee. He received his doctorate from Vanderbilt University and is currently professor and chair of the Department of History at Wheaton College right here in Illinois. He taught for many years at the University of Washington, where he was a recipient of the University Distinguished Teaching Award and holder of the Donald W. Logan Endowed Chair in American History. Tracy is the author of two books on the American Civil War, and we were very fortunate to have him deliver the keynote address at the Civil War and Sacred Ground Moral Reflections on War Conference that the Raven Foundation co-sponsored with the Center for Applied Christian Ethics at Wheaton College. That was in 2012. And Tracy's great lecture on that is on the Wheaton website and can easily be found by Googling the title. Yes, yes. Go, or going to the Raven uh, website. Okay, there you go. We Even have better. links all over the place, Tracy. It was brilliant. <laughs> we don't want anyone to miss it. Right. Um, Tracy is also president of the Conference on Faith and History, a national association of Christian historians, and you can follow his blog, also called Faith and History. Where is the blog, Tracy? What's the blog address? Do you know? Uh, it's uh, Faith in American History at WordPress.com. WordPress. I meant to look that up before, but I got distracted. So that's, thank you, that's great. So Adam, what's coming up? Uh, well, we've got a bunch of good things coming up. Uh, on the 21st, this Thursday, we're going to have an open chat. And it's been a while since we had our last open chat. I mean, we've had discussions about anorexia and mimetic theory. We've had discussions about uh, biblical interpretation. Uh, and we're going to have this discussion about yeah. uh, faith, uh, history, and Thanksgiving. Uh, and the history of the scapegoat. And the we had this term scapegoat. Yeah. Right. We had the history of the scapegoat with David Dawson. So we've got a lot of topics that we can uh, kind of flesh out in that open mm -hmm. chat. Mm -hmm. And then in December on the 5th, uh, that's still up in the air, um, but on the 12th we're going to be talking with uh, the Reverend Dr. Stephanie uh, Van Slyke, our our, uh, pastor. our pastor and friend, mm -hmm. about uh, incarnation and what is the Christmas story trying to tell us about what God is doing in the world? Mm -hmm. so, incarnation and salvation. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. Yes. So, and then on uh, December seventeenth, that's the Tuesday, uh, we're going to do another open chat about uh, Christmas and um, that kind of stuff. Yes, so, and yeah. hopefully Paul Nectarline will be with us on the 5th. We're just trying to confirm that with him. Right, right. So that's a brief yeah. look. Oh, in January we're going to be talking probably with Tony Jones uh, on his upcoming book on Moltmann and Girard about atonement. Um, and Nadia Bowles-Weber will join us sometime in January. And so we've got some a lot of really good things coming up. But we've got the best thing coming up right now, which is Tracy McKenzie. Yes, we are so thrilled to have you with us, Tracy, especially since it's the week before Thanksgiving, um, and we want to talk with you about your latest book from InterVarsity Press, which is The First Thanksgiving. Yeah, I'm going to hold up. it up. Here's the cover. Yeah. The can you read it? I'll read it. <laughs> the First Thanksgiving, What the Real Story Tells Us About Loving God and Learning from History. So, Tracy, I have to admit that if I didn't know you and know your work already, that book title might have raised a few little red flags for me because you've got Thanksgiving, God, and History all bunched together in that title. And a random reader of that title might be forgiven for thinking, uh-oh, here's another one of those Christian histories that's basically using the past to justify some position that we hold today. And you actually address that directly in your book. You call it using history as ammunition. Um, and happily, it's not something that you do in your book. Uh, 
Um, but you do point out that it's not uncommon for Christians to go back and use history, especially the first Thanksgiving, as evidence that we're a Christian nation, which must mean we should have you know, prayer in schools and the Ten Commandments in courthouses and all of that sort of stuff. Um, because after all, who were our founders? God-fearing, thankful, prayerful Christians. Um, so that must be who we should be, right? So what I want to do right away is jump right into that thorny problem and ask you about history as ammunition and what you recommend and what you practice actually instead. Well, thank you, Suzanne. That's a, that's a great question. Um, let me preface right at the outset that I I think – we should expect to learn important truths from the past. I, I, I don't shy away from that uh, idea. Um, the reason I wrote the book, is, though, really is to challenge Christians to think or to be open to the possibility that we're missing the kinds of ways that, that history can really uh, challenge us and change us uh, because of the way that we approach it. And as you've already suggested, one of the ways that we approach it uh, and I think this is widespread. It, it is something that uh, tempts us all, regardless of our religious or political uh, beliefs. Uh, we're going to be tempted to go to the past and to find what is familiar, uh, to go to the past, to find what reinforces what we already believe, and maybe to go to the past uh, in search of justifications for agendas that we have uh, in the in contemporary, uh, contemporary life. And so that's what I call going to the past for ammunition, uh, looking for some sort of leverage in a contemporary debate. And that's wrong on any number of levels. It's wrong first because we don't learn anything. One of the things that's true about uh, the search for ammunition is that we never, ever, ever will be educated because we never, ever will learn anything that we don't already know, if I could put that in quotation, quotation marks. We're also going to be tempted, though, to, to do something that, from a Christian perspective, is morally problematic, and that is... Uh, to give authority to some figure in the past. And so you said already, uh, Suzanne, we'll be tempted to say, well, the, the pilgrims were Christian. They were the founders. That means America was founded as a Christian country. Uh, that means uh, or should have some bearing on how we uh, organize our society today. And what we've done in the process of that is we've taken uh, a, uh, an objective statement about the past and we've turned it into an imperative statement about the present. We've said that there's something about uh, some figure or group in the past that gives them sort of intrinsically authority over our lives. And just speaking from a Christian perspective, I think when we give authority where God has not uh, granted it, that actually is one of the attributes of idolatry. Uh, and so I think as Christians, we would want to be very, very, very careful uh, that we not cross that line. So instead of going to the past for ammunition, I talk about going to the past for uh, illumination. Uh, in other words, rather than thinking of uh, searching for some kind of evidence that we can then turn to uh, our neighbor and say, see, this is something that you need to know, uh, we actually uh, try, if possible, to make our own lives vulnerable, uh, to make ourselves vulnerable. The way I put it is to allow the past to ask us hard questions, uh, to put the burden of proof on what we believe because if we're willing to go to the past in a kind of very open-ended way, we will encounter people who see the past totally differently than we do, uh, whose worldview would challenge our own. Uh, and going to the past for illumination means uh, respecting those figures enough to listen to them, let, us, let them ask us hard questions, and to be open to the possibility that they see things that we do not that we need to see. I love that. That, that is awesome, because one of the other tendencies that I see uh, in doing history, especially from, uh, I'm just going to say, like, um, kind of more progressive people, is kind of a scapegoating of the past. And mm -hmm. um, so what we end up, so, the, so one of the tendencies that we can have is to say um, how horrible uh, the pilgrims were uh, for bringing all of this destruction upon the Native Americans. And certainly, I don't want to say that wasn't horrible, but there's a certain sense in which, you know how Jesus says in the Gospels that if, you know, if we had lived in the days of our ancestors, we sh certainly wouldn't have been like this. There's a certain sense in which we can use history as a way of scapegoating our ancestors. Right. right. Yeah, a absolutely. I the, the distinction that I like to make, and it's a 
it's not a, a totally clear-cut distinction, but I try to distinguish between what I call moral judgment, uh, which is a kind of moral inquiry that is really focused outward, that's trying to evaluate the behavior of other individuals that we encounter in the present or the past. That I would call moral judgment. What I really want to challenge us to pursue is what I call moral reflection. Uh, if moral judgment is oriented outward, moral reflection is oriented inward. Uh, and we, um, uh, if possible, always try to in, in embrace moral issues and ultimately turn them to a kind of a spotlight on our own hearts. So the, uh, the classic biblical parable is Jesus' parable of two men who go into the temple to pray. Uh, and the one um, uh, says, Lord, I thank you that I'm not as other men are. I'm not as, uh, for example, this uh, lowly sinner beside me. And the other person is saying, Lord, have mercy on me. Uh, and so when we encounter injustice in the past, we, we don't want to whitewash it ever. Uh, but I'm, I'm actually dubious about the power of sort of hypothetical uh, moral uh, evaluation. That's to say, if we say, if I had lived at such and such a time, if I had encountered such and such a circumstances, I would not have done uh, this and, and such. Uh, I think that's pretty much worth the paper that it's written on. Uh, but if we can see the kinds of, of moral dilemmas that people encounter in the past and look for ways that they exist, if not exactly, at least analogously, in our own lives, then that actually puts our own lives to, to the test. Ultimately, if our moral uh, inquiry asks nothing of us, I think almost always it becomes a form of self-indulgence that, if anything, probably feeds our sense of, of righteousness. And so if we feel that we're heading down that path, uh, usually I think we need to put on the brakes um, uh, and see if there's a different way to approach the issue that requires more of us personally. Tracy, does your approach to, uh, I'll say, reading history um, have any correlation to how we might approach scriptures, how we read mm -hmm. scripture? Um, because I think a lot of times we tend to go to scripture for ammunition. Um, Absolutely. And don't Right. Learning <laughs> from reading right. scripture. Yeah. No, I think that's a great analogy. It's one that, that depending upon the audience, might resonate with uh, with folks when we talk about the way we go to the past. One of the things about um, going to the past for ammunition, it's sort of analogous to what we sometimes would call proof texting when we go to the Bible. We, you know, open up your concordance, you look for the word, you find the word, you've got the answer uh, to um, the particular question that you have. And we know that when people proof text, they're not necessarily being malicious. They're not necessarily uh, wanting to distort uh, the scripture. But neither are they truly uh, showing a respect to uh, that uh, source of insight that, that it really requires and demands. Uh, and so I, I think uh, just as we might go to scripture uh, in search for that one particular passage that tells us exactly uh, what we need to do in the, in the present, uh, in doing that, we don't really enter into the world of, say, the early um, early Christian uh, church. In the same way, when we study the past, uh, unless we're willing to to try to enter sort of imaginatively into the world uh, of the period that we're studying, uh, we almost always will, to some degree, uh, misrepresent what we find. Um, uh, and, and I think that's a very real problem. One of the things that I say about going in the past is the past always is some combination of things that are familiar to us and things that uh, seem strange or foreign to us. Uh, I think to some degree those elements are always there. The things that are familiar is what seems to make the past relevant to us, but it's the things that are strange to us that makes the past powerful because it's in that strangeness of the past that we usually will, will find our own values um, challenged. And I think it's exactly the same way when we read scripture. Uh, very often um, when we see something that sort of resonates with what we already believe, there we think is truth, uh, and too often that's where we stop. Uh, and this is a, a way of, um, of thinking about the past where we, we want to encourage ourselves to meditate, to grapple, to wrestle with the things that seem strange and foreign when we first encounter them. Uh, more often than not, that's the path to, to real um, challenge and change.
Yeah, it's a, that, that point where we're feeling uncomfortable. That's not when we should stop reading. <laughs> um, I, you know, let's maybe this is a good time to segue into some of the um, true story of Thanksgiving because there's some real strange things about that first Thanksgiving menu. And in a lot of ways, that menu has had authority. Oh, it's an imaginary menu has had authority over our lives for a couple hundred years, I guess. Um, so I'm wondering, it's kind of a fun place, and you start sort of there in the book a little bit with some of the oddities of that first meal um, and how yeah. strange it seemed to us today. Right. So yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a great question, Suzanne. I, um, I like to talk about the menu, and, and honestly, um, menu's not very important. You know, what the pilgrims had to eat, that's not the, the, the most important question by a long shot. And yet... Uh, and yet, when we address that question, um, we, we learn a great deal about the degree to which we have imagined what that first Thanksgiving was like. And once we realize how much of our memory of Thanksgiving is, um, is really invented, that ought to help us to think more deeply uh, about um, the occasion. So let's just talk about the menu for a moment. Uh, everything we know about that event in the fall of 1621 comes from a letter that one of the pilgrims named Edward Winslow wrote back to England in the fall uh, toward the end of that year, 1621. Uh, and in the course of a letter to financial backers in London, he devoted five sentences to a celebration that took place, these five sentences totaling 115 words. Uh, and in those five sentences, he says that uh, William Bradford, by then the governor of uh, Plymouth Colony, uh, set aside a period of time so that they might celebrate uh, the harvest, the fruit of the harvest that they had brought in. Uh, and the letter says that Bradford sent out four men, quote, on fowling. So these individuals were uh, basically hunting for, uh, for birds. Uh, and that's all it says about what they had to eat. That's the sum total of what it says uh, about uh, what they had to eat. So there's no indication of turkey. There's no reference to pumpkin pie nothing about stuffing, nothing about any of the other things that we always assume are part of an authentic Thanksgiving meal. So we sort of have to go back to other kinds of evidence that we have about the pilgrims to uh, basically to form an educated guess of what was likely an important part of their diet. One of the things that we'd say, I hate to tell this to anyone, um, uh, but there's just almost no chance that turkey was a major part of the uh, of the menu. There's a visitor who goes to Plymouth in 1627, and he stays for a few weeks, a uh, quite prominent Englishman, and he writes about his experience. He talks about the turkeys. He's fascinated by these wild turkeys who are almost impossible to bring down. Uh, even if you hit them, he says, they're still so fast that they're almost impossible to catch. Um, the pilgrim's weapons, you have to remember, are these matchlock muskets that were very tall, very heavy, in fact, so heavy that they were fired on a tripod. So I guarantee you they weren't bringing down rapid birds. What they were doing almost certainly was hiding in a blind around the various ponds around Plymouth. Uh, and in fact, uh, Bradford says in another context that uh, in the fall, just these ponds would just be blanketed with water birds, with ducks or geese or swans. They probably hide in blinds, wait for the birds to settle, and then blast away. It's not very sporting, but it certainly was more effective, uh, I think. So they're probably having duck and geese. We know that one other item of uh, protein that uh, Bradford says was very plentiful was eel. In fact, that's one of the things that Squanto, the very famous uh, Wampanoag Indian, Tisquantum is his full name, Squanto uh, teaches uh, the pilgrims, we know this from childhood, about uh, how to plant corn. Uh, but Bradford spends much more time saying that he taught them how to uh, dig eels out of the riverbeds. Uh, Squanto could uh, dig them out with his bare feet, uh, and Bradford brags on them. He says they're fat and juicy and sweet, uh, and that in a matter of an hour, they could fill a hogshead uh, with these eels. Uh, in terms of other things they might have had, um, they wouldn't have used Indian corn except possibly for something like a, a, a mush. What the pilgrims liked to plant in their gardens was what today we would call greens, so turnips and collards and cabbages and lettuce, uh, leeks and onions. So I always say, if you want to have an authentic Thanksgiving meal, serve uh, turnips and eels, and it's much more likely that that was what the pilgrims had uh, than Thanksgiving, uh, than uh, turkey and, and, and stuffing for Thanksgiving. So is that a big deal? No, I wouldn't say so. But when we realize how far our memory of uh, the event 
strays from what was likely the case, that ought to give us a little bit of pause about the way we think about the event uh, on the whole. Yeah, and I'm sure how quickly it changed from eels to turkeys. Um, and I, I think you're also going to debunk the myth that they watched football all day. <laughs> yeah, that's probably probably so. Although, very interesting, I have to tell you about football. Uh, football has been an important part of the way Americans have celebrated Thanksgiving for a lot longer than I thought when I first began uh, doing research. Actually, it, it begins to be linked with Thanksgiving Day about the end of Reconstruction, that's to say in the late 1870s. And by the 1890s, uh, it is the social event of the season among the upper crust of society in New York City and uh, Boston and Philadelphia. And there are as many as um, 30, 40,000 people attending football games in the 1890s on Thanksgiving Day. Uh, and in fact, I've come across an editorial in one of the New York newspapers where this writer is lamenting that Thanksgiving has become nothing but uh, a holiday granted by the state to free up people uh, to watch a football game. Uh, so uh, that has a longer history uh, than we realize. Yeah, wow. So, Tracy, was that first um, meal, this first Thanksgiving, we're talking about a meal that was held in 1621, right? Would yes. the pilgrims have called it a thank? Would the people there have called it a Thanksgiving dinner, meal, whatever? That's a great question. And let me answer it uh, a little bit, uh, complicate it just a little bit. <clears throat> uh, if the if the reason that we ask the question is to try to decide whether this event in 1621 was fundamentally a, a religious event or a secular event, um, if we if we start there, uh, I would I would want to emphasize that the Pilgrim's worldview uh, led them to believe that God was involved in every aspect, every detail of their lives, and every good thing, like the writer of Hebrews said, every good and perfect thing comes down from above. So if they are celebrating. Uh, the harvest, in some degree, they are acknowledging the goodness of God. Uh, but if the question is, did the pilgrims think of this event as a thanksgiving? Uh, the answer is, I don't think we can be sure, but it's quite likely that they would not have thought it, of it as a thanksgiving. And that's because when they thought of thanksgiving, they had something very specific in mind. Thanksgiving was a holiday that they believed was authorized in the scripture. And the, the pilgrims were very strict in the way that they uh, read Scripture and the way in which they saw Scripture as a guide to life. They, they followed what theologians would call regulative principle. If it wasn't explicitly commanded, they often did not think they had the freedom uh, to adopt a practice. Uh, and so they were very careful about holidays. They did not celebrate Christmas. That's one of the great things to remember about the pilgrims because they said uh, effectively, show me in the Scripture where it tells us to celebrate Christmas. Show us in the scripture where it tells us when Christmas, when Jesus uh, was born. They say you can't do that. Uh, and so it's a man-made holiday. They didn't even celebrate Easter because they believed the scripture never authorized treating any Sunday uh, different from, uh, from the rest. So basically they felt in terms of holidays that the Sabbath was authorized. Uh, and they believed that the example or example of Old Testament uh, writings uh, led to believe that they could call for special days of humiliation and fasting. Uh, that would be in some time of extraordinary trial, and they would humble themselves before God and pray for his deliverance. And they also believe they're authorized to call for extraordinary days of thanksgiving in response to God's uh, sort of um, uh, unusual or unique intervention uh, to provide for them or to deliver them from a particular trial. So when they thought about a day of thanksgiving, they thought of something that was uh, never planned or scheduled well in advance. Uh, it was observed irregularly, not for something that would have been, of, been considered um, uh, part of God's normal plan for uh, his creation, like the, the harvest cycle, but for something more extraordinary than that. And then it would have been celebrated in six, eight, ten hours of uh, worship and uh, Bible teaching and hymn singing and uh, prolonged prayer. It would have been sitting around the church. It would not have been out in the field. It would not have been uh, playing games with Native Americans. Uh, it would have been a very different kind of environment. So that's a very long answer to um, a question that's more complicated than it seems on the surface. Uh, it was, uh, in some sense, uh, a celebration infused with religious significance but it was not a day of Thanksgiving as they would have defined it. So are you 
telling us that the pilgrims would be very surprised and maybe not approve of celebrating Thanksgiving every day at the end of November? Uh, yeah, you know, I, I hate to speak for the pilgrims, uh, but but we can't. I can say a, a few things. I, I think the pilgrims believed that there was a power uh, in the calendar. Uh, that there was actually teaching going on as we sort of, uh, as we convey our beliefs uh, to succeeding generations. There's teaching going on uh, in the way we structure our calendar. Uh, and scheduled holidays, I think they feared, uh, became hollow rituals. Uh, and so that was certainly something that, that concerned them greatly. And the truth is, um, to, the, to the degree that we know for sure, the, the records for Plymouth Plantation really don't become to be uh, uh, very uh, complete at all until the late 1620s, so several years after the uh, arrival of the pilgrims. But from the 1620s on, there's no evidence uh, that there was a regular uh, Thanksgiving, or I should say autumn celebration like the one that we remember as the first Thanksgiving. There's no record that the generation that came over on the Mayflower ever did this ever again. Uh, so at the very least, what they would think of our tradition, our tradition isn't theirs, uh, even though we remember them as the founders of that tradition. It's that's not really a very accurate statement. So who who are these pilgrims? Were they seeking religious freedom, or what, what were they up to? Uh, you know, when we talk about the pilgrims, we really mean um, usually we mean the people who come over on the Mayflower, 100 people or so, uh, and they fall pretty naturally into two groups uh, that. Uh, sometimes referred to as uh, saints and strangers or pilgrims and strangers. Uh, that is to say, some proportion were members of um, the Leiden congregation, uh, some having roots going back to the Scrooby congregation in North England that had come to, to Holland around 1608 or so. Some proportion, I'm being intentionally vague here because we don't know exactly how the numbers break down, but some proportion were not part of that congregation. They're added uh, to the uh, to the group uh, when the pilgrims go from Leiden back to England, 1620, uh, and they may have been to some degree sympathetic with the uh, religious convictions of that Leiden congregation, but we're not at all sure that that, that was uh, the case. But so when I talk about the pilgrims, usually really I have in mind that Leiden congregation, and these are individuals that uh, uh, had their roots in uh, separatism. The separatist movement was a a subgroup of a subgroup within the Church of England. The, the Puritan uh, group within the Church of England were individuals who believed that the Reformation uh, that had begun in England uh, in the uh, period of Henry VIII uh, had never really uh, been sufficient, had never really changed the practice, uh, the ritual, and the hierarchy of the Catholic Church, uh, which uh, they believed uh, lingered in, in much too much substance. So the Puritans wanted to purify the Church of England and were willing to work within the Church of England and work gradually toward that end. But the separatists were a minority within the uh, Puritan group who had come to the conclusion by um, about the end of the 16th century that the Anglican Church was, was not even, was, it's really beyond uh, reform. It was beyond um, uh, salvaging, really. And, and in fact, the way they would have put it, no true church at all. And so they had arrived at the conclusion that they could not, in good conscience, stay and continue to work within uh, the Anglican Church. And so they come out, they separate themselves. And when they do that, it, it's, a, it's a very radical step. And we need to remember that the pilgrims are in a movement that, for its day, would have been considered extremely, both theologically and politically, radical. Uh, in refusing to worship any longer as part of the Church of England, they are basically... Uh, uh, acting in defiance of the church authorities, and they are committing treason against the state, since the church is a f um, formal state institution uh, in England. So they're enemies of church and state, and it's not surprising that ultimately they believe that they need to leave uh, the, the country. So they are they're theological and political radicals, uh, and um, that's part of their story that I think we, we lose sight of. We, we sort of domesticate the pilgrims, I think, uh, more than perhaps is, is proper.
But they they did flourish in the Leiden uh, community for a, a dozen years or so, if I remember correctly. But something prompted them to go further away, uh, even from from their native land. Can you explain what what um, prompted them to leave um, Leiden? Yes, that's uh, you're right, Suzanne. And I realize now that I, there's one question you posed, Adam, that I never really. Uh, address and that was uh, the, their motives. We have to remember the the Pilgrims' migration from London or from the from England uh, to uh, New England uh, as a two stage process. And so that that original migration to Holland, I, I think it is accurate to say that it was a migration that was motivated uh, primarily uh, f uh, because of religious persecution and a desire for religious freedom. So they go to Holland in uh, 1608. Uh, because they believe it is the most open and religiously uh, tolerant society uh, in Europe at that day, and, and I think that's accurate. Uh, William Bradford, who writes about their experience, really writes in glowing terms of the kind of religious toleration that they encounter there. Uh, in fact, they're, they're almost in awe of how, uh, how uh, welcomed they are to practice uh, the religion uh, that they believe the scripture uh, constrains them to practice. So it's not a search for religious freedom that ultimately propels them to leave Holland. And in that respect, I, I, I think we, at the very least, miss the mark a little bit when we say the pilgrims come to America in search of religious freedom, because they have that, they enjoy that uh, in Holland. But there are other things that uh, Bradford is saying the pilgrims uh, are, um, uh, are, are troubled by. Probably the, the thing that he gives the greatest attention to is economic opportunity. Uh, uh, most of them, uh, of course, are coming from a rural background in England. When they come to Leiden, they originally tried to settle in Amsterdam, moved on in less than a year. When they settle in Leiden, it's a town of 40 to 45,000. may not sound very large to us. It's actually one of the largest cities in Europe of its day. So it's a very urban environment. Uh, they're earning their living uh, in handcrafts, probably half of them at least working in the weaving industry. Uh, but as non-citizens uh, of Leiden, they're precluded from the, some of the most well-paying, highly skilled crafts that are regulated by guilds. So they're limited to what we sort of call piecework. They're working at home in, in houses that probably have no more than 300 square feet for the entire family. Uh, they're working from dawn to dusk, six days a week, uh, and they're eking out a pretty marginal living. So that's an issue. And, and Bradford is saying that um, the reality of the matter is that many of that congregation are having to weigh the religious freedom they enjoy uh, against the very, very uh, difficult material circumstances that they uh, are enduring. So that's one thing. Second thing that they're... Um, that Bradford is calling attention to uh, is that um, as they stay longer and longer in Leiden, they see their children in particular conforming more and more to Dutch culture. And it's interesting as a parent, I, I sort of chuckle when I read some of the things that they uh, write about. Uh, it's clear if you read between the lines that the pilgrims like to spank their children and a lot of the Dutch families thought that they were too harsh uh, and in fact are, are trying to discourage them. Uh, it's also clear that the pilgrims believe that the Dutch families are too um, too much conformed to the culture in a variety of ways. They don't observe the Sabbath nearly as strictly as the pilgrims did. There are other ways in which they believe that their children are sort of being gradually uh, seduced um, to more worldly ways. And so ultimately, I think it would be fair to say that they leave Leiden for New England uh, absolutely determined to perpetuate the religious freedom that they have, but not to acquire something that they didn't have. Perpetuate it and hopefully add to that religiously uh, tolerant uh, environment um, opportunity to, to earn a better living, frankly, materially, and the, the cultural autonomy to, to raise their children in a way that seems protected from some of the influences they thought were adverse and uh, enlightened. So, well, Tracy, what would they think of the pluralistic society that grew up um, in the 400 years since <laughs> they've been here? Right. Uh, you know, it's 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 a it's one of those hypothetical questions. Uh, but if I guess if we imagine a um, a time machine and we sort of plop them down 
uh, four centuries later, or nearly four centuries later in um, North America, what what would they say? Um, one of the things I, ha I think we have to be very careful about, I, I think there are ways in which the, the Pilgrim's uh, example, I believe, is challenging uh, and convicting. We need to be very careful, though, that we don't impute to them values that they simply didn't have. Uh, a lot of the definitions that we would have today of liberty, for example, of toleration, um, would just not have made any sense in their world. And, and we ask far too much of them to have the values that we that we have. So their understanding of uh, toleration, for example, uh, was uh, something very different from what we would imagine. So let's go back to their English uh, environment where they had first um, encountered, uh, they believed, religious persecution. They believed that the established Church of England was engaging in practices that were unscriptural, scripturally indefensible. Uh, they also knew that the Church of England would not allow them uh, to uh, openly defy the church and practice what they believed was right worship. To add to that, the, the law of England at the time made it illegal for them to leave the country. So think about the kind of catch-22 they're in. Conscience tells them that they cannot support the established church. The law tells them not only uh, can they not criticize the church, they can't uh, leave it. Uh, they're really caught between a rock uh, and a hard place. So when the Pilgrims set up uh, a new government in New England, they actually believe that they are establishing a much more tolerant environment. But it's not going to look like it to us. What made their environment tolerant in their mind was that if you did not believe that the church was um, uh, conforming to Scripture, then you had every freedom to leave. Now, today, if I said to you, you know, uh, you know the criteria for your living in this community is you have to um, uh, endorse the established church, and if you don't like it, you can leave, well, how would we hear that? We'd hear that as the most high-handed, arrogant, kind of intolerant uh, idea imaginable. But literally, in the context of the early 17th century, to say, if you don't like it, you can leave, was a right that the pilgrims did not have in England, which is why part of the story I haven't mentioned, but they literally have to, to hire smugglers to secret them out of the country. And they have to try that at least two occasions, if not three, before they're successful. So their understanding of religious freedom is, again, it's very different from our own. And the early laws of Plymouth, uh, the first laws that are codified come in 1627. And these laws have all kinds of restrictions on religious behavior. Uh, they didn't necessarily, they would not insist that someone be a member of the church because they believed that that could only come out of a kind of genuine uh, spiritual um, heart relationship uh, with, uh, with God. But they did believe it was acceptable to require church attendance. Uh, they actually fined people for not honoring the Sabbath. Uh, they fined people for blasphemy, for criticizing the pastor and so on. So there are all kinds of restrictions that um, that we would today say were religiously intolerant, and in their view, uh, were not. Uh, if you were Quaker, couldn't live, couldn't live in Plymouth Colony, for example. I think, I think we need to bring back charging people for criticizing the pastor. Oh, that would that's be a good. good idea. We could make some money off of that. That would be great. Uh, Tracy, uh, I love the cover of your book. Um, this this image of what we typically think of as the first. Thanksgiving. And I have two questions that I want to ask you about, uh, specifically about that cover. Uh, when I was in seminary, one of my professors said, leave it to theologians to make something as infinitely interesting as theology boring. And I, <laughs> suppose, I suppose one could say the same thing about historians, except for you, because <laughs> you are... Uh -huh. You are. This book is so interesting, and part of the reason why it's interesting is because you're just a you're just a funny guy. Um, can you talk a little bit about the misnomer of the first Thanksgiving? Yeah, I might be able to do that. One of the things that um, has always struck me is that if you think about um, if you think about the very phrase first Thanksgiving, it can't possibly be literally true. Uh, I mean, none of us literally is arguing that no one ever thought of uh, giving thanks to God for God's blessings uh, until the pilgrims suddenly uh, came up with the idea in 1621. Uh, so we, we, we think of Thanksgiving uh, 
um, certainly now is, is something that surely many um, peoples around the world have done in different times and places. And in the North American context, surely many of the Native American peoples were uh, in, in their particular way uh, expressing thanksgiving for the bounty of the Creator. So it's not really accurate to call this event the first uh, American Thanksgiving. I suggest that if we want to keep the Native American peoples in mind, we might say the first American European Thanksgiving or something like that. Uh, but it gets complicated very quickly because there are all kinds of European uh, antecedents, uh, groups that claim that there are Thanksgiving celebrations that predate 1621. Uh, there are claims from um, uh, descendants of Spanish uh, explorers who were in St. Augustine, Florida uh, in the 1560s, some evidence that some kind of Thanksgiving celebration might have taken place as early as uh, 1565. Uh, there's a claim that there was a celebration in Texas near present-day El Paso in the 1590s. There are claims from Protestants in uh, Jacksonville, Florida area also in the 1560s. There are claims from descendants of Virginians, from people in Maine. Uh, there are more and more and more of these claims. So ultimately, I suggest that if you want to be absolutely on the safe side, that the most accurate label for uh, this 1621 celebration is so we could call it the first American Protestant Christian Thanksgiving north of Virginia and south of Maine. And I feel real confident about that as a, as a label, uh, but I don't expect it to catch on. And the only, the only reason I go into that, and that's really sort of the opening of the book, the only reason I go into that is I just want to, hopefully with a little bit of humor, nudge us into realizing that there's a lot of selective memory that goes on all the time in the way we remember our heritage. Uh, and this uh, reference to the first Thanksgiving is just a classic case in point. It wasn't the first Thanksgiving, and yet we have designated it that, and we've designated it that for reason. Uh, we, we tell the story of America in such a way that this becomes a very important chapter. Um, one of the things I like to say about the pilgrims is they are our adopted ancestors. Now, we all think about adopting descendants, uh, and that there's a sense that we have some choice, some agency in choosing uh, who will be enfolded into our family as our descendants. But this idea of choosing our ancestors is something that doesn't make any sense if you stop to think about it except when it comes to historical memory. Uh, and the reality is we have chosen to adopt the pilgrims as our ancestors. Uh, and that in itself, as a story, I think is very intriguing. It says that for whatever reason, we have believed that they have stood for some set of values or beliefs uh, that we want to embrace, to endorse, uh, as central to what it means to be uh, American. And, and one of those is, as you mentioned earlier, this um, search for prosperity, for economic opportunity. And yet, at, at one point in the book, you talk about sort of the um, that they do succeed um, finally after much hardship in achieving some sort of economic success. And they uh, there's a certain lament about that. Um, right. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure, yeah. This, this whole relation between the pilgrims and economic prosperity uh, and economic mindset, it's very complicated. And uh, one of the things, you know, we talked about at the beginning of our conversation about how we can use uh, history as a source of ammunition. And this is a classic example uh, of that. Um, one of the ways that the pilgrims have been remembered uh, is as uh, a group of individuals who were really uh, ultimately converts to capitalism and then enthusiastic uh, supporters of capitalism. And I'll just share a little bit of why that might be in some minds a plausible conclusion. The original uh, agreement that the pilgrims have with uh, some financial backers that uh, finance the, the migration to New England was an agreement in which uh, they would enter into a kind of joint agreement uh, in which they would pool their resources and pool their labor and pool their profits uh, for the first seven years uh, until they were in a position to pay off their the debt, the money that they had borrowed uh, to finance uh, the venture. Uh, and William Bradford, in his history of the Plymouth Colony, of Plymouth Plantation, he says that about 
uh, two and a half years or so into the venture, in the early months of 1623, uh, the, the, the Pilgrim settlers came to the conclusion that as long as everything that they owned, and it wasn't literally everything, even the homes that were being built were not to be owned uh, individually, that as long as everything was owned in common, uh, there were some people who probably were not working very hard, some people who were becoming discouraged and so forth. And so in that uh, springtime of 1623, they decide for the first time basically to abrogate their agreement with the financiers who had bankrolled them uh, and to begin to divide up the, the land. And they do so in an incredibly modest way. That very first crop year uh, of division, each family gets one acre for its own, uh, and then the rest is to be farmed in common. But Bradford talks about that, uh, and ever since, individuals have uh, latched on to that. And they've suggested that uh, one of the great morals of the Plymouth uh, or the Pilgrim story uh, is that they began with socialism and ultimately embraced capitalism, and that was the secret to their survival. I've read that in many instances. I can just tell you uh, the most uh, recent. I just finished a book uh, that came out about the same time as mine, and it's called Rush Revere and the Brave Pilgrims. I don't know if anyone has, has heard of that. It's written by uh, that famous historian Rush Limbaugh. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Rush, Rush Limbaugh makes this really the centerpiece of his story, uh, that the pilgrims um, uh, gave up on their more communal or commonwealth kind of approach, uh, embraced capitalism, and he has all this happening in 1621 so that literally the first Thanksgiving, they're thanking God for showing them the benefits of capitalism. Well, I just think the story is dramatically more complicated uh, than that. Um, that. They certainly do ultimately move toward independent, uh, private ownership of the, of the crops uh, and ownership of the, the harvest. But their, their understanding is so much more complicated. To begin with, they see this as a concession to weakness. They, they see this not as something to be celebrated, but it's actually a concession to the human, human frailty, uh, that people ought to work hard for the common good. Maybe they don't always. That's not ideal nor to be celebrated. Perhaps realism uh, requires us to acknowledge it. Uh, but it's a sign of our fallenness. It's not part of God's design for necessary uh, maximum human flourishing. Secondly, the, the comment that, that you uh, referred to earlier, I think, Suzanne, William Bradford, um, I want to back up just a moment. The, part of the reason that ultimately they, they want to pursue more economic opportunity uh, in North America is not really because they desire a place where everyone can uh, sort of get all that they possibly can. Because so many of their congregation are struggling Many of the people in Leiden are, are watching as individuals are, are forced to return to England to make a living, even if that means giving up their religious uh, freedom and uh, breaking away from the congregation. They don't want to see that happen. So there's a very real sense in which they're moving to uh, North America in search of greater economic opportunity in order to allow the congregation to stay together. This is not a kind of freewheeling, individualistic kind of movement. It's a movement of a body that recognizes a need for greater opportunity in order to continue to promote their interdependence among each other. The problem, uh, as it unfolds uh, in William Bradford's view, is that the greater economic opportunity that they encounter comes with temptation. And what discourages Bradford is that within 10 years or so, uh, Others are coming to uh, to Massachusetts. Uh, the great migration that we remember associated with John Winthrop uh, and that Puritan migration. Uh, and many of the pilgrims are beginning to uh, want to farm larger land in order to sell these new migrants food. And pretty soon they're wanting to leave Plymouth because there's not a lot of space. They're wanting to move farther out uh, to have larger farms. And eventually they move so far that they can no longer worship together and we can, they can no longer worship together, they split congregations and start new congregations. And so Bradford believes that ultimately the time had come when the pilgrims had so desired economic opportunity that they had been willing to sacrifice the unity of the church. Uh, so that one of the last things he writes about in his book, and he's writing of Plymouth Plantation about 25 years after the arrival, 
And he says that that original church is left like a mother forsaken of her children. So it's this image of a kind of widowed mother who's been abandoned. Um, if you read all of Plymouth Plantation, there's a real song, a uh, strain of lament to it. Uh, and it's not just a celebration, oh, wonderful, we have economic opportunity, now we can all get uh, much, uh, have a much richer life than we would have otherwise. In fact, also, if you read the Pilgrims' laws that they established in the late 1620s, they actually have all kinds of laws that suggest there are limits to what individual pursuit of self-interest uh, are, are acceptable. Uh, and so they'll, they'll make it illegal to sell food outside the colony if there's any shortage within the colony. Um, they'll um, have other kinds of restrictions like that that, um, that suggest it was never a kind of unrestrained sort of endorsement of economic individualism. Which, you know, Tracy, it's so interesting that perhaps in this weird way that we adopted the pilgrims as our ancestors, they used, you point out in the book they were kind of forgotten for 150, 250 years. I can't remember the dates, but, and then sort of, you know, reimagined. Um, maybe we did that because we need their witness nowadays um, mm. to give us some opportunity to reflect on our rampant individualism and pursuit of success and prosperity. I mean, it's maybe, you know, God works in mysterious ways. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I you mentioned that the pilgrims were sort of um, uh, hidden away for a period of time and then rediscovered, and that's exactly true. The main sources that survive, first of all, are, are limited. There's only a couple of sources that speak about the pilgrims in any detail. And in different ways, for different reasons, both of them, really sort of fall out of circulation for a period of about a century and a half, if not more. Uh, and so William Bradford's History of Plymouth Plantation actually does not, it's not published uh, until the 1850s, so about 230 years after the arrival uh, of the Pilgrims. Uh, and uh, it is, it's the case that um, the Pilgrims are sort of rediscovered uh, in the middle of the 19th century. And from that point on, we've tended to remember them uh, as having uh, the values that we hold at, at the moment. Uh, and so I, I think it is, it is so valuable. One of the ways that I think history is important to us is there's a sense in which it lets us to see ourselves um, with new eyes. Um, and let, let me just give you one example of this. It's going to seem like a trivial example. But the, um, the pilgrims uh, actually did not believe in church marriages. Uh, and it always sort of, I think it's jolting to say that because we think of them as uh, sort of the, the ultimate uh, embodiment of family values and uh, Christian um, practice. They didn't believe in church marriages because they said, again, show me in Scripture anywhere where God uh, requires a church marriage and authorizes priests to perform it. We, we certainly have a reference to Jesus attending a marriage and so forth, but Nothing that um, requires or uh, gives that authority. And so they associated church marriages with uh, the Catholic Church and efforts of the Catholic Church to expand uh, the influence of the clergy. So they would have said it is absolutely one, one sign of true zeal for Scripture is that you'd never allow a priest to marry you. You'd be married in front of a civil official. Well, of course, that's just upside down. It's upside down from the way I was raised. Uh, any you know, devout believers certainly going to be married in a church before a, a clergyman. Well, hearing that, it, it began to cause me to think, you know, okay, so why do I think that? Why do I believe that um, that being married in a church is absolutely uh, the proper Christian response? Uh, and what I discover is that I can't point to chapter and verse any more than pilgrims could, and it has way more to do with values that I've simply inherited. I was born at a certain time in history, in a certain cultural context, and I absorb the values of that culture. So uh, even this, in this trivial example, the pilgrims are sort of showing us what I had come to take for granted so much that I wasn't even aware of it, I didn't even think about it. Well, you mentioned, Suzanne, the individualism of American life. I think that's a classic example, much more important than this one that I've shared with regard to, to marriage. When we take the pilgrims' values seriously, I think it does sort of throw into bold relief the kinds of individualism that we take for granted. Just to give you one example, uh, to start the very beginning, 
uh, one of the first laws passed in Plymouth Colony makes it illegal for a single male to live alone. They actually, they absolutely think of uh, society in terms of groups. We think of society as conglomeration of individuals. The individual is the constituent unit of society. Uh, I think most of us uh, today. Pilgrims would have seen that as just bizarre. Uh, individuals were defined in terms of their relationship to multiple overlapping groups. So individuals were members of families, they were members of churches, they were members of civil communities, but they didn't exist independently. So in Plymouth, for many years, you couldn't you couldn't live alone. Uh, you would be assigned into a family uh, if you uh, were not a member of a family. Uh, in with regard to these other groups. Politics is a good example. Today we think of politics as this freewheeling public space in which individuals uh, basically come to, uh, into shifting coalitions to accomplish agendas uh, to, to get what they want. Um, Pilgrims thought of politics as a, uh, a body defined by mutual obligations. If you were uh, chosen to serve and hold an office and declined, you were fine. If you didn't vote and were eligible to, you were fined. Uh, they really define things much more in terms of obligations to serve the group uh, than as um, uh, negotiating and brokering to get uh, your particular uh, agenda accomplished. The, the, the quote that always just drives this home to me is from uh, John Robinson, who was the pilgrim's pastor in Leiden. He was talking about liberty. Today, of course, we think about liberty entirely, almost entirely in individual terms. Uh, liberty is the freedom to get what I want, go where I want, say what I want, and so on. John Robinson says the Christian's liberty is to love God in truth and serve man in love. Uh, and I just love that idea of liberty being tied to one's obligation of service to the Creator and to the neighbor. And that's just it's so so foreign to us today. Um, uh, and I think the pilgrims help us to see how different our values are. Wow. That's something we talk about here a lot in terms of mimetic theory, is that the individual is sort of an artificial construct, actually, because we, 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 we sound like pilgrims maybe a little bit, because we talk a lot about how who we are can't be separated from, as you say, our culture, our community, our history. We just don't exist without... We're brought into being by all those things, and to pretend that we're not somehow dependent or tied in or sometimes blinded by um, those factors is uh, is a little bit of an exercise in denial. Mm. Yeah, no, I think that's I think it's a very good, very good point, very good point. And and if I could just uh, come back to a point that we talked about earlier, when when we say that the pilgrims had a different set of values. That doesn't automatically translate into a conclusion, then we must change to conform to the pilgrims, right? Because what we don't want to do is be thought of as giving authority to the past. What the pilgrims do for us, though, is simply help us to see. Uh, and one of the things that I, I think uh, as a historian is that the values that shape who we are, more often than not, uh, the most deeply, the most influential values, are values that eventually become invisible to us. They're, they're so deeply uh, inculcated. They're such a part of our culture that we just become un unaware of them. And so what the pilgrims can do or some other groups in the past is they simply bring those values to light again. What was invisible becomes visible. And if, if we are Christians trying to take every thought captive, uh, this is a real service to us because it helps us to see uh, practices that we've fallen into perhaps without much thought or reflection or a desire for guidance. Um, and when we see them, uh, we can begin to think about them and to evaluate. And I firmly believe we can never, we can never evaluate something that we're not aware of. Uh, and what the study of the pilgrims or other groups can do is to help us uh, in a, an important way to begin that process of, of thinking deeply about the way we want to live. Allows us to see our blind spots and, yeah. and see those. That's, that's awesome. I love it. Uh, the Let's other see. the other question that I wanted to ask you about the cover of the book uh -oh. <laughs> is is I know we're coming to the end yeah. of our time with Tracy, but this is like the right time to bring up the big topics. Um, 
What, can you talk a little bit about the relationship the Pilgrims had with the Native Americans? Mm. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes, uh, yeah, that's a great question. I'll, I'll just share a little bit, and you can ask for more uh, elaboration if you want. Um, you, know, you know, the way we remember the story, uh, or the way we have remembered the story, I should say, since about the beginning of the 20th century, uh, is that the Thanksgiving story is is a it's a real success story of very different peoples, separated by a lot of cultural distinctives, uh, coming together and and being able to cooperate uh, and to um, to serve and benefit from one another. And there's an element of truth to that, but there's also quite a bit of uh, imagination. I think it's uh, revealing if we remember that the way that the Native Americans are remembered by uh, uh, the culture for several centuries after 1621, uh, they remember it as a threat. And so many of the images, for example, the paintings of Thanksgiving in the 19th century uh, will show, literally, they'll show pilgrims celebrating around a table uh, and there will be arrows flying in from a distance as Native Americans are attacking. Or there are images of pilgrim uh, families at the threshold of their home and there will be a dead uh, Native American on the threshold, and it's clear you're supposed to conclude that uh, uh, he has attacked and the father has defended his home. Indians are always a threat, and I think they're always remembered as a threat uh, as long as uh, the question of the place of Native Americans in American life is still an open, controversial issue. And it's really not until a total removal or a concentration on reservations uh, that the majority white population begins to remember Native Americans in a different way. And it's only literally in the 20th century that we begin to remember the pilgrims as an important part of that, of that gathering. Now, in terms of the relationship, the uh, most important thing uh, to keep in mind is that before the pilgrims arrived, there had been a lot of contact with Europeans uh, before that, and that contact had introduced disease. Disease, we don't know exactly when, but probably by the 1610s, early 1610s, uh, and that disease had had a devastating impact on the indigenous population of North America. So this area around uh, Cape Cod uh, and Plymouth is an area where the native population has already been devastated by disease. And so when the pilgrims arrived, they're arriving on, uh, they're settling uh, on an area that had been once an a area teeming with Native American peoples, and Plymouth itself had been the home of a people called the Patuxent, uh, who have been almost literally erased because of uh, disease. Even those uh, Native American peoples that have survived, in most cases, have been vastly weakened. And so the pilgrims arrive at a time when the sort of traditional relations among the multiple peoples in the area have been totally uh, disturbed, and there is no clear uh, pecking order yet of, of which are going to be dominant and, and, and so forth. And that probably gives the pilgrims a kind of leverage they would not have had uh, otherwise. They're actually able to enter into an agreement with the Wampanoag uh, that is a kind of peace treaty that lasts for about half a century. Uh, and that is a kind of success, I think, uh, that's important to remember. In terms of the actual 1621 event, um, Go back to the, the idea that there's only 115 words, five sentences that have survived about the event. Uh, and what Edward Winslow, the pilgrim writer, says, he says that we exercised our arms. This is part of one sentence. And when he means that, he doesn't mean they did calisthenics, that they were engaging in military drill. He says, we exercised our arms, the Indians coming amongst us. That's all one sentence. And I think the juxtaposition of those two things is revealing. We don't know for sure. You have to speculate. But he links military drill with the presence of Native Americans. So many historians have speculated, and I think it's plausible, that one of the reasons they're uh, uh, sort of engaging in military drill is to kind of show force, uh, to remind the Wampanoag, who outnumber them significantly, that they still have uh, a lot of military potential uh, and strength. The other thing about what Winslow says is when he says the Indians coming amongst us, that's a kind of cumbersome choice of words. He doesn't say that we invited them. He doesn't say that we chose to have a celebration and we wanted to invite our Native American neighbors. He says they showed up. And, and basically all I would say is we can't know any more than that. They could have been invited. It's just as plausible that they just 
showed up. And the reason I think that is plausible is that uh, other records from the time suggest that they did do that uh, quite often. So it wouldn't have been the first time if they had come uh, without an invitation. Um, but it seems so much more uh, encouraging for us to remember it uh, that different different way. Final thing, you, you've held up the picture of the book several times, uh, Adam. What almost never gets captured in the pictures of the first Thanksgiving uh, is the fact that the, the uh, Wampanoag were so much more numerical, uh, so many more of them than, than there were pilgrims. Uh, by the uh, celebration, there were probably about 50 uh, uh, survivors of the Mayflower's uh, passengers. And uh, Winslow says that Massasoit shows up with about 90 uh, Wampanoag men. Uh, and so a good picture would show at least two Native Americans for every uh, pilgrim. Uh, and I think that would give you a totally different feel uh, of the gathering than what we usually remember. Um, that's, that's excellent. I have, I have one last question for you, Tracy. Uh, a lot of our audience uh, are pastors and preachers. Do you have any advice on how to uh, maybe bring in – the history of Thanksgiving as you tell it into a Thanksgiving sermon. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. I've actually I've thought about this a little bit. I am no I'm not a a pastor, but I have thought about um, the kinds of insights that I think are more than just historical insights. They're insights that really perhaps challenge us uh, in ways that go much more to uh, the heart. Um, I think the thing that strikes me most. Uh, about the pilgrims uh, is uh, an aspect of their worldview that we've completely lost sight of. And the way I, I tend to refer to it is it's hidden in plain sight because it's actually, uh, the clue to it is in the name that we've given them. Now, the name pilgrims is something that was not widely used at all to describe the passengers of the Mayflower uh, until about the time of the American Revolution. So a long time will go past before they're remembered in that way. But where we get that uh, um, name for the for the group is from um, a sentence in William Bradford's um, history of the Plymouth Colony. Bradford um, uh, is writing about the departure of the Pilgrims from Leiden uh, in 1620, and you have to understand that the majority of the Pilgrims congregation was not going uh, to North America; they were staying in Leiden. Uh, and they had every reason to believe that this separation could be permanent in this lifetime, at least. They would never see uh, their loved ones again. Uh, and uh, Bradford uh, writes about them, uh, and he says that with an abundance of tears, they left that goodly and pleasant city which had been their resting place near 12 years. But they knew they were pilgrims. And look not much on those things, but lift up their eyes to the heavens, their dearest country, and quieted their spirits. That phrase, they knew they were pilgrims. It's the only time in the entire book that that word pilgrims is ever used. And that's what we've latched on to, uh, to, to label these people. When Bradford says they, he, they knew they were pilgrims, he's almost certainly quoting from the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews, verses uh, 13 through 16. And that famous chapter in Hebrews often remembered as the Hall of Faith chapter, this list of the great heroes of uh, Old Testament. Uh, the writer says that these individuals knew that they were strangers and pilgrims. And so what Bradford is saying is that the pilgrims understood their identity. They understood that the world was not their home and that became the kind of mindset and the kind of context for the way that they interpreted all of life. Uh, and that just struck me. I have a colleague retired now at Wheaton College who says of, of, of all the places that we can imagine, next to heaven, excuse me, next to hell, I'm sorry, next to hell, heaven is the last place we want to go. Uh, we don't think about anything beyond this world, perhaps because this world is so comfortable for so many of, of us. Pilgrims had a different, I would say, in a certain sense, an advantage over us in that their lives were so, so much defined by physical hardship. Uh, their life expectancy was so short. Disease was rampant. Death was a, a constant enemy. And in that context, uh, they could say with the New Testament writer, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most to be pitied. 
their understanding of pilgrims was a reminder their identity was not as citizens of this world, not as well-adjusted citizens of this world that the culture wants us to be, but as citizens of, of a higher and a better country. And that, to me, is the message above all. You know, when I finish this project, the thing that I, I hope will never leave me uh, is that the, the pilgrims offer us a reminder of clear identity in Christ. Um, I know that's something I struggle with, and I suspect many of us do. Wow, that's an excellent point to leave on. Thank you for yeah. spending so much time with us, Tracy and uh, being with us today to talk about, I'll hold yes. it up one more time, yes. the first Thanksgiving. And we did not cover all of the book, oh surprisingly. <laughs> so, there is so there's a lot more in there. more in there that is awesome. Yeah. Um, thank so, you so yeah, much. Yeah, thank you for being with us. Uh, just a a reminder, absolutely, my pleasure. Awesome. Just a reminder that uh, this Thursday we're going to have an open chat uh, to discuss uh, Thanksgiving and many other topics That's that we've right. been discussing in the last month. Um, so once again, thank you, Tracy, and uh, we hope to talk with you again soon. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> Same to you guys. Bye-bye.